Well, happy Friday, everyone. Um, and, and here we are to do another one of these uh, here in, in lovely downtown Chicago. Um, hello, Chuck. Um, as always, a pleasure to see you. Um, and yeah, today uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that I have, have come across over the years just in terms of optimization. Um, this is, you know, I call it questions in optimization. The answers are optional, not guaranteed. Um, we will uh, definitely run across some things that um, there, there maybe even isn't a clear answer, but I want to, I think in this one, as in all of them, I want to give you some, some ideas for how you would poke at these problems and come up with your, with your own solution. Um, and let's see, before we get started, um, I, you know, as usual, I'll be putting the notebook up at the same, in the same repo. Uh, I don't have it there yet um, today actually this week the past couple weeks have been kind of on the busy side so um, I'm, I'm a little bit just a little bit behind the curve in getting things pulled together um, so we'll we'll see how this goes um, same thing you can find the quick Python book in the same old place you can find PyCon 2020 in the same old place uh, that's uh, all sort of up there and the books kind of closed on PyCon 2020. Uh, lots of other conferences and things coming up in the future though. But uh, more important, and let me switch over to the sort of showing the main view here. Uh, more important than, um, than that is the fact that uh, we're having the PSF Board of Elections cycle going. So I know as I've announced, I'm not going to be on the board. I, I want to do other things and, and just sort of uh, try out some other stuff. But uh, the nominations are still open till the end of the month. So you can go uh, and, and nominate somebody. I mean, it would be polite to make sure that they agreed. Uh, similarly, if you want to nominate yourself, that is not vain, that is not discouraged. In fact, pretty much everybody nominates themselves. You have to sign off, you have to be a willing player uh, for this board stuff to work. So by all means, um, you know, you can, you can certainly go ahead and nominate yourself. Um, and that's the link for, uh, and the nominations link is there. Uh, the link for PSF board elections is more just the general elections page. Uh, once the nominations close, starting in the beginning of June, uh, there'll be seven days when you can look at everybody's nominating materials. Uh, and every time you go look at it, it's in random order. That's something that I worked with Ernest uh, on, uh, for last year so that we didn't have this problem where some people got their names at the top of the list and then other people at the bottom of the list didn't get enough attention. So uh, we tried to make that a little bit fairer. Um, now, if you want to vote in the election and you haven't, you know, you don't know that you're already eligible, if you uh, are an organizer who spends uh, five hours a month organizing um, uh, events for the Python community, or you work on uh, like the documentation, certainly if you spend that time working on Python code or something that is kind of a key uh, element of the Python software ecosystem, all of those things, if you spend five hours a month, uh, you can go to a form and self-certify uh, and uh, then you can be a voting member. Uh, of course, if you're uh, an, an, you know, a chosen fellow, the, those people can vote uh, always. Uh, if you are a supporting member, meaning that you have spent, um, that you've, you know, support the Python Software Foundation with the $99 a month membership, or $99 a year, excuse me, $99 a month would be nice for the PSF, but not so nice for the members, I think. Uh, but if you are doing the $99 a year membership, then you, you have a vote. Uh, and in general, any of those things you should have. You can, if you're a volunteer, self-certify 
uh, to give you a voting member through the end of the month. Uh, and it might take them a couple days to get it sort of added in, but uh, as long as you do it by the end of the month, you should be uh, eligible to vote. So um, particularly um, the, the people who have voted in the past have tended to be from uh, North America and Northern Europe. If we want to have broader representation, uh, then we need to get people from other parts of the world uh, in there as voting members so that they can vote for people who more have their voice. And I know, as I've said before, I've talked to a ton of organizers uh, in, uh, for example, Latin America, uh, in Southern Europe, uh, in Africa, in Asia, all of those places. Um, you're organizing the stuff. Go ahead, become a voting member and vote. Uh, and uh, I've got a link here. Carolini Dantes did uh, a, a little how-to with, with screenshots and everything on how to go sign up as a basic member. Once you sign up as a basic member on the PSF site, that's free. Then you can go self-certify uh, and become a voting member. So that's, that's my, my plug for, uh, for becoming a voting member and voting in the PSF board election. So... Uh, I do hope that people will do that. Um, yeah, it's it's a good thing in my opinion. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about optimization. Again, um, you can, um, and let me fix this. I want this to be a little bit different. Uh, I meant to have that be somehow nicer, but it's not. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, so. Again, this is experimentation. I hope that you uh, go ahead and try these things, but keep in mind, none of this stuff is meant to be a cookbook. None of this stuff is meant to be copied and pasted into production. If you do, it's on your head. It's, it's not me, okay? Uh, so um, I always start talking about optimization with this quote from Donald Knuth. Uh, the real problem is that programmers have spent far too much time worrying about efficiency in the wrong places and at the wrong times. Premature optimization is the root of all evil, or at least most of it, in programming. So, I mean, um, Knuth is like the god of programmers, so take that to heart. Um, optimization and worrying about things like that, in many, many cases, should be one of the last things you worry about. Um, and you should only do it where you need to because um, programmer time is precious. Uh, in general, CPU and computer time is in general cheap. So, you know, you wanna make a balance there, so only optimize when you need to. Uh, because, and this is kind of my corollary, uh, if you look at your code, you can always find something that you can optimize. The trick is deciding whether or not it's worth optimizing. So that's, that's the thing to keep in mind. Uh, yes, you can do it, but is it actually worth your time? So this is something I find particularly uh, people who once they get out of the beginning stage and start to understand how things work, um, you can see opportunities to optimize everywhere. And um, the trick then as you become a more mature developer is knowing that, yeah, we could do that, but nah, it's not worth it. So it's something to keep in mind. Now, optimization I think, in my experience over the years, optimization kind of comes down to three factors. Uh, you can save processor time, you can save memory footprint, or you can save disk access. And actually, if you do it right, you can kind of compromise and you can sort of improve up to two of those. Okay, if you focus just on one, you're likely to get the maximum benefit for that, but you can trade off a little bit and you can sometimes get kind of good results improving two of them. Uh, there is no way 
And trust me on this, I make very few absolute statements, but I'm going to go out on a limb here after 30 years. There is no way you can optimize, really optimize all three. You've got to choose. So the question is, what do we care about most? Okay. Um, usually, usually we're into uh, time. Uh, faster is better. Um, um, yeah, I don't know what I that I'm not even making sense here. What was I talking about? Faster usually requires um, that that doesn't even make sense. Let me take that away so I don't look completely stupid. There we go. Uh, faster is usually better. Most of the time when people are talking about optimizing, they're talking about time. And particularly when you have super big data sets or, or, or a super big chunk of data you need to move around and process, uh, time can be important. Um, you know, if you have to process every day, you have to process a giant feed of information uh, and you can't get that done in 24 hours, that becomes a progressively worse and worse problem every day. So time usually is what people think about. Some cases, um, it may be memory footprint that's essential. Maybe you've got a lot of things going on or you've got a small device. Uh, these days with Internet of Things and embedded devices and all of that. Uh, or maybe you've got a giant, giant set of data uh, that won't all fit in memory. One of, any of some of those things. So sometimes memory becomes uh, the key thing. And then disk access. Usually disk access is the flip side of time, although sometimes it's the flip side of memory uh, in that we tend to write to disk when we're either trying to, when we're trying to save memory, but every time that you write to disk, it takes a lot more time. So um, it takes um, a lot of time. If you're still using a, a disk with a physical platter that rotates, that takes, that takes in computer terms forever. Uh, if you're going to an SSD, a solid state device, it can be faster but it's still not ideal. Uh, if you're writing to RAM, that is even faster. If you're writing to specific optimized registers that are even on board the processor, that's even faster. But in general, you know, it's not worth worrying too much about the distinctions other than um, basically going to disk will slow you down. So in general, we like to, to avoid that. Fair enough. Um, so, I, what I kind of want to do is I want to show some things that I've done uh, for uh, optimizing, uh, but I also want to like show you some ways that you can figure out what's going on and some things to that. You know, and I just want to touch on some things that you might think about when you're testing an optimization. Because here's the thing, spending a lot of time on an optimization is no good at all unless you're pretty certain that it actually uh, is in some way or another useful. And to find that out, you need to do some testing. And what I really encourage, I encourage this to the, the people on my team as well, is that you do some tests and try to figure out whether or not your optimizations are likely to be uh, useful or not. I mean, there's nothing worse than having some sort of performance bottleneck having a, a developer or two or however many work on it for a couple of weeks and come back. And not only has they made the code more, more complicated and harder to use and more likely to break, but they have gained only a couple percent, uh, you know, improvement. Uh, that's just a very, very depressing thing to have happen. So you don't want to do that. So when you're testing optimizations, um, as you might expect, I, I keep the things I look at fairly simple. So we're only going to talk about some pretty simple tools. But the things you need to think about as you're testing an optimization is you do need to be careful not to get uh, fooled by other things going on when you're doing your testing. Uh, if you're developing and testing on your laptop, for example, you need to be really careful about, you know, do you happen to have a big Chrome window open in the background? 
or in my case, as my team will tell you, do you happen to have about 20 or 30 Chrome windows in the background, uh, taking up CPU and RAM and things like that? Uh, is there some other process that hits at that point that's going to be taking I.O. or taking up or other parts of the CPU? Uh, so you kind of need to try to control for those factors. Uh, one way you can control for those factors is do the tests uh, you know, several times and average them so that you can kind of see what's going on. But you, you want to keep that in mind. Um, another thing that you might want to keep in mind, and I don't, I don't have anything dealing with it in, in the examples today, but it is kind of a fun thing to explore, is that, uh, for example, if you need to sort data, there are um, a bunch of different sorting algorithms. Uh, and in fact, if you want the sorting algorithms uh, uh, illustrated, there is on YouTube, there used to be at least, a series of videos where um, there was a, an Eastern European dance team that illustrated the sorting algorithms using dancing. So you could see the person dancing around for a bubble sort and merge sort and all of those things. It's a hoot. But there are different sorting algorithms. And in fact, they perform differently depending upon what the data is like in terms of its sorting. So some of them will do better if your data is mostly sorted with a few exceptions. Uh, but on the other hand, they'll do terrible if your data is, for example, in reverse order, uh, then others will do really pretty darn good if uh, you have mostly a random set, and then if it's mostly sorted, you don't really gain much. Uh, th this all depends. So there are lots of things to think about like that when you are, are looking at that. But the, the bottom line, as I sort of started out saying, is try to test and measure as much as you can so that you can figure out if you're really improving what you think you do. Uh, after, after, as I say, three decades in this business, what I've seen all too often in, in both my work and other people's is that you end up optimizing for not what it is you need to optimize. So it's just something to keep in mind. Okay, now I'm going to hit a couple of these things. I talk about measuring and, and things like that. So the first thing uh, I mentioned was disk access. And in a lot of ways, as far as we're concerned, writing Python code, disk access is not something that we grapple with as directly. It's an issue, but um, it's, it's not so simple to just look at, at, at your Python code while it's running and figure out how much disk and things like that you're accessing. So um, some strategies to cut down on disk access are doing your file reads and writes in the largest chunks possible. So one access to get a megabyte of data is gonna be way better uh, than, uh, you know, a hundred accesses that are all getting, uh, you know, one hundredth of that each time. Uh, so you're going to be faster if you bunch your disk access reads and writes. Um, it's also, I guess, worth mentioning that reads are way better than writes as far as data access. Uh, writing tends to take a little bit more time. It's not as pronounced, I don't think, with, with SSDs, but certainly on rotating platters, uh, writes are the worst thing. So you can keep that in mind. Caching as much as possible is a good idea. Uh, and then the main thing is try to do as much as you can in RAM rather than on disk. And that is a slippery one, as I say. I'm, I'm raising the questions, not necessarily prompting, uh, coming up with the answers, but in general, the goal is then to avoid writing to disk, particularly avoid reading and writing to disk. So how can you measure? Um, in general, I guess in my experience, the problem in terms of disk access has been usually on such a coarse grain scale that I have mainly relied on um, built-in tools. So um, I, here I mentioned using top. Uh, and let me just switch over to my other things so that I can show you my shell. 
here. Uh, top is a Unix tool. You can also look at um, like uh, Macs have a, a system uh, system utilities uh, utility for your your uh, disk consumption. Uh, you know, they're basically the activity monitor. Windows has something. A Mac also has top. There are various things. Uh, here I've got uh, a Unix thing going. So this is this is Linux top, which I'm, I'm most used to. And it, it will show you some various things. Some of the things that it will show you, though, are um, for one thing, it will show you if you're using swap memory. And that's worth keeping track of because uh, swap memory is basically when, me when uh, your actual RAM is full and you're saving uh, this. Okay, Chuck, uh, see you later. Uh, so um, as I say, um, if your actual real RAM is full, then it gets saved to uh, a, a swap partition or a swap file. It gets written to disk in pages. Uh, this happens behind the scenes by the operating system. You don't, you don't do anything for this. But in fact, if you find that your swap is getting full, that means that you are actually in trouble for, um, for your various, uh, that you're going, to, that you're using disk when you don't intend to. That's what I, I mean to say. So that's one thing. Now, the other thing here, I noticed I sort of uh, actually got all four processors showing, uh, is that you'll see here, there are some things that will tell you how much idle space your, your CPU has. So that's useful in knowing whether or not you're maxing out your CPUs. Uh, these are all pretty much doing nothing right now. That's fine. Uh, there's how much the user is using, how much the system is using, uh, things like that. But the other thing that's really important is this thing. And different versions of top will display this a little bit differently, but this is um, keeping track of the number of wait states, the number of times that um, basically your system is waiting either to read or write from disk or to access disk or things like that. Uh, and um, if you have something that is I.O. bound and there's a lot of read write stuff that's really holding things up, this is where you will find that the wait states go way up and you'll get like a really high percentage there. So that's that's another thing that you can look at. So that is top. Um, and I think I want to switch back to my regular window here. I mean, I'm amazed that switching's actually kind of worked OK. Well, good for me. Uh, so. Um, in general, as I say, the other things you can look at for that is that you can, of course, use uh, other tools to see what your disk is doing. So if you are actually worrying about reading or writing from disk, uh, you can actually see if you've got, um, for example, a log file or a dump file or something like that filling up. But usually when we're talking about avoiding reading and writing to disk a lot, uh, part of it is using swap file or if you're using some sort of temporary files. So that is usually not so hard to figure out that you've got a problem. Uh, and it's usually one of the first things to, to check. So then the other part is saving memory. Uh, and here, uh, this is a reason that um, Python is, is better than, um, Python 3 is better than Python 2, is that many, many, many things that, that Python 3 does are optimized to save memory. So um, things like range is automatically a generator. It doesn't generate a whole list in memory. It feeds you one thing at a time. So using Python 3, which we're all doing now because Python 2 is dead, uh, is one way to save memory. And yes, actually, in, in terms of you're using HTOP, there are uh, a lot of different tools and people have their own ones. And as far as which tool you want to use, you know, make yourself happy. Um, I tend to, um, and this won't shock you after having listened to a bunch of these, I tend to be really lazy about it 
and I use whatever is available on the system by default. So since we use a lot of uh, CentOS stuff and whatever, that's the top I'm most used to seeing. And I don't want to spend the time installing anything custom. Now, if you're working on, a, on your own environment or you have control of that, you know, it's perfectly, perfectly cool for people to decide, no, this is worth it to me. I want to use this uh, because it saves time. So, you know, everybody has their own tool. But the idea of using something like Top is the thing that I, I, I wanna, wanna recommend. So yeah. Um, so um, another thing that you can do in terms of saving memory is to um, sort of encourage garbage collection. So whenever an object no longer has any references in scope, uh, then it will be a candidate for garbage collection and it will be garbage collected pretty quick that is that memory will be freed up so uh, you know the thing then is to um, if you're if you're creating all sorts of objects to create them in such a way that they go in and out of scope fairly quickly and they're not hanging around forever so you know one example of things that would hang around forever are things that you uh, attach a, a global variable to uh, that's going to be there no matter what so if you have tons and tons of global variables you've got tons and tons of things taking up memory that you don't necessarily need to have presumably uh, if you're really, really obsessed with saving memory, you can run the Python interpreter with the dash uh, OO flag to remove strip out the doc strings. I'm going to show you that in a second because, of course, before we get to the dash 2 flag, there is a dash 1 flag, and I, I want to show you that too, but we'll do that in a second. Uh, and then... Um, if you're really, 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 really obsessed with memory, of course, there are things like MicroPython and, and CircuitPython, which is the variant that the Adafruit people have done that is, is, is really, they're both really brilliant things, that are Python 3 designed for embedded devices. Uh, and they will run in uh, not just megabytes, but even just kilobytes of memory. They're amazing, amazing things. Uh, obviously, you make some trade-offs, but for a large number of things, something like that is another way to save memory. But how do we measure memory? Uh, and I want to poke at this a little bit. So uh, get ready here because I'm, I'm going to be asking some questions about this. So in any case, um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a size uh, function. Python doesn't have a built-in function that will tell you the size of stuff. And I want to kind of look at this whole size issue. How much memory does a Python object take? So it turns out that if in the sys library, there is a get size of thing that will have a stab at that. So I've used this to make my own little size function. So let me just compile that, make sure I got that here. And then here, to test this out, uh, I'm going to, actually, I want to, I want, let me remove all of the outputs because having the outputs there always spoils the surprise, and I hate that. I like to have the surprise. Okay, so there. So I am going to just stringify 1,000 integers and put each one of those 1,000 strings in a list. Okay, and I'm doing this rather than just using the same letter over and over again, like I could have a thousand copies of the letter A, but those would all be the same object, or would they? I don't know. Let's just make different objects. This way, uh, by actually stringifying that, I'm, I'm making different objects. And I'm going to start at zero and go up to a thousand. Uh, I use this structure for a reason. Later on, we'll, we'll, we'll see why. Uh, and so that'll give me a list. And uh, let's see what we got. So it says that the size of my list of um, 1,000 strings containing integers is 9,024. 
cool. Um, that that doesn't sound impossible, no. I mean, um, we know that like, uh, well, let's actually look at it. So we know that the first item on my list is going to be the string containing zero. Uh, let's actually just see what we've got here. So the last 10 items are these three digit strings. Okay, um, it, it looks all right. So this number is plausible, no? Okay, so now I've got another one, okay? And this time I'm going to stringify uh, the squares. And I'm, I'm going to comment out the size thing. Again, I don't want to spoil the surprise. So this is, this is kind of a thinking one. So I made my list. Now let me show you the thing here. So now we've got our last ones. These are six digit numbers, right? Okay. So my question is, what do you think we're going to get when I do size of V list? Anybody cares to have a stab at that and type it into chat? Um, I love you for it. Uh, if not, I'll just wait awkwardly for a while and we'll move on. I mean, you know. It will be more than a list, but you know it's a trick because you know me. Uh, okay, well, let's see. Let's see what it is. Uh, nope, it's 9,024. Now this is definitely not intuitive. What's going on here? Well, we can think about possible scenarios. Did we just sort of does it automatically reserve a certain amount of space for those strings? Um, hmm, let's actually look. So, well, I've got a better idea then. Uh, here, I'm basically going to make uh, 1,000 lists of 1,000, okay? so. I'm going to do this a thousand times and each time I do it, I'm going to do my same old, let's make a, a list, let's stringify the square of the numbers. And notice that uh, basically I'm um, starting from zero, then I'll start from one, then I'll start, et cetera, and it'll go up to 999 as my starting point. So they're going to be lists with at least some different content. And, you know, presumably starting at 999 and ending at, uh, and ending at 1,999, they're going to be longer even than, than six-digit strings here. So um, I'm going to fire this off. Uh, it doesn't really take that long to do. It takes a little while. Uh, there we go. Got that. So if we look at this... Um, we got, see, we're starting here. This is, this is not surprising. Uh, and if I look at, let's, let's look at the last one, last item. Here we've got um, some, some seven digit numbers. And actually, if we look at like the, um, let's do the last 10, last 10 of the last item. Uh, we'll see. We got more numbers. So, so this is definitely taking up more space than that. I'm sorry, because now not only do we have uh, bigger items, but each one of them is a list of a thousand of them, right? Okay, so here's my question. What do you think we're going to get now when we try the list, the size of this item?
size of a list times 1,000, that would be, that would be reasonable. But in fact, it's 9,024. Yeah, I know, that's kind of cosmic, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, somebody is definitely uh, on the right track. Um, so in fact, when we do something like this, or we use the get size of thing, basically, uh, in the, uh, that's in the, in the sys uh, library, all we're getting is the size of a list of a thousand items. Okay, we're not getting the size of the items in the list. We're just getting the size of the list that has these variables that refer to a thousand different items. So they could be anything. And if we've got a thousand items, we're probably going to get something pretty much similar in that size. So this isn't like C because of the way the variables work. Remember, we talked about that when we were talking about, you know, the what is a variable thing, uh, the, the first, first one I did of these. Um, so the variable is just a reference, just the label. So a collection of a thousand labels in a list is a thousand labels in a list. And we don't have, using this tool, a good way of knowing uh, how many things are actually inside or what the size is or anything. Now, there have been, um, there have been ways to do this. So uh, basically, uh, and I got this one uh, a few years ago. It's, it's from a Stack Overflow answer and it kind of works, but basically this is a get size method that is a hack that tries to recursively get size to everything uh, so it walks through all of the things, so, you know, and it's got uh, a little bit to make sure that we don't look at the same object twice. It's got that. Uh, and then it checks to see if we've got a dictionary, uh, if, if, we, if it's an iterable. Um, and as you dig into the way Python does its objects, there are all sorts of ways that you could fool this. So this is not either a, like a reliable way, but this does get us a little bit closer since we don't have that many layers of indirection, since we're not using types that are super funky, uh, we can kind of do this. So let me compile this guy so it's here. And then we can do get size of a list uh, is actually uh, 60, 61. Uh, thousand bytes. That's actually probably a little bit better because strings have a certain amount of machinery and string objects take a certain amount of space. Uh, so that's probably fine. And if we make bigger strings, well, it's going to get a little bit better, but bigger. But in fact, uh, it's all of the stuff that goes into a string object that's kind of giving us the bulk of this 61,000 uh, bytes. And then if we do uh, this one, uh, we should get something that's way bigger. And notice this, this takes a while to think because it now is actually going into all of those 1000 lists and looking at the objects inside. Um, and I promise it won't be a whole lot longer, but it does take a little while as it's sort of thinking, thinking, thinking. Um, and there we go. Uh, and it, it's definitely bigger, so it's actually then, um, it's more than a thousand times bigger, but then again, we've got larger data stuff. Most more of our data is, is larger elements, so uh, it's, it's, it's reasonable. I mean, it's really difficult, in fact, uh, in, in practical terms to, to really track down the size of these things, um, and again, that means that um, honestly, there, while there are strategies you can use and there are tools that will help you, most of the time it's probably um, the, the first kind of rough way of seeing if it's even a memory problem is to go back as I did before and look at top 
and see if a particular process is using a lot of RAM. Uh, so let me see, let me pop back over to that. I'm getting really confident that my, my stuff has been going. So here, um, for one thing, you can get a really uh, quick kind of gross up view of memory by seeing how much memory it's a process is being you is using. So right now, bash and top, they weren't using much memory, but that that was there. Uh, again, if your memory free is going down dramatically and your memory used is going up dramatically, then you know that you've got uh, a, a problem with memory as well. All of that is very, very rough and ready, very much on a kind of a, a, a coarse grained level. But before you start digging in with the other tools which take a certain amount of work to use, it's really handy to know, is this really a memory problem? And uh, honestly, I've, I've ended up uh, having these kinds of debates with, with people on my team, et cetera. I was like, oh, I'm gonna go optimize the memory or things like that. Uh, and in fact, uh, we don't wanna optimize the memory because that's not the problem. So um, that's, that's probably the, the handiest tool you can use to check that out. Uh, but you can keep in mind, just because I've got a list, uh, it's all of the stuff in the list and how many objects are actually being created and then not going out of scope and being garbage collected. So that's, that's something that you might wanna keep in mind. Uh, okay, so um, the last one then is time. And I, I'm thinking maybe I, I saved enough time to talk about saving time. Uh, and there are, are some various things that we can do. So number one, if you want your thing to go faster, that is take less time, uh, is you can use memory and avoid disk. Uh, part of that is using LRU cache, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, you can save a lot of time if you can pre-sort your data. So um, one project that I had about five years ago that I, I, I like to tell stories about is where I had to process um, two million rows of product data plus 20 million rows of attribute data plus another one or two million rows of cross-reference data plus another million rows of alternate product data. I had to merge all of those together and, and sort of update a database and I had to do that every night from a flat file and that was kind of tough. Uh, but one of the things that saved me was basically I used the uh, Unix sort command to pre-sort all of the files so everything was in the same order. So I could just kind of walk through all of the files together rather than doing anything else. So pre-sorting is good. And if you've got large files, particularly if they're large flat files or things like that, if you can, uh, sorting them outside of Python is the way to go. Uh, if you can do it on a, a well-indexed database, that's that's probably the way to go. Or uh, if you can, if you've got, as I had, I had text files, flat files. Uh, I used the, the Linux, the Unix sort tool. And it's, it's way faster in producing a sorted file than I could do it in Python. So you might wanna use that. Uh, some other things that we'll look at as we go through here are sets and dictionaries are handy for saving time. Uh, comprehensions uh, or uh, even sometimes using the map function. Uh, map function doesn't get a lot of love, but uh, we'll hit on it very briefly. Or using Cython and uh, assuming that our time performance is acceptable, uh, I'll try and show you some of these things. But before we do, I want to show you another oddity of Python. So you may have heard but it's also quite likely you may not have heard that you should never use uh, assert statements uh, in code that is like central for production. That is, it shouldn't actually be part of your production code. It really should only be for testing. So if you've heard of the assert statement, that's something that says, uh, if this thing is true or not true or whatever, uh, raise an assertion error and then you know specialized asserts are used all over the place in testing so you know you're likely to have seen them 
And then sometimes people get the idea that it would be handy to use them in, in other functions. So let me show you this. So here I have written uh, a, a Fibonacci uh, recursive function, okay? Uh, as I've said before, I'm fond of things like Fibonacci series because uh, it's something that requires, what should I say, a calculation. So it's a good problem, but I don't really think about the problem. I think about what this is kind of telling me about my situation. So it's my favorite example. So I've got a recursive Fibonacci generator, and here I'm asserting that the number must be zero because if the number isn't, uh, isn't greater than zero, if it's zero or less, I, in this implementation, I have no check for that, and it will attempt to recurse forever. And basically, uh, that's the problem with infinite recursion is that you run out of uh, run out of stack space and uh, it sort of blows up with an error saying you've recursed too much. So here I am, I, I know about asserts. I think, ah, this will be great. I can keep this from ever happening in my code if I do this. Because if I do this, then if it's less than zero, it's gonna blow up and that's a good thing. And notice here, I'm using the other thing. There is one thing in Python that is a global constant. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is the Dunder debug. It is a constant that is set when you run the interpreter. It will either be true or false, and you can't change it. So 99% of the time, when you run Python, normally the debug, Dunder debug is going to be true. So here I'm saying, yes, please, let's debug this and show me my various steps as I recurse all the way through. And then here, let's return my result. Okay, now I'm gonna need to switch over, back over to, to my shell. So let me do that. And then let me run Python normally. Uh, I would prefer to do this in IPython, but um, it's been a hectic week. I didn't have time to set up a, uh, the kernels that I needed, so. This is normal. So um, let me see here. I'm going to, uh, I, I've saved exactly this file uh, and I call it uh, debug flag, which we'll find out later. And I'm just going to import that fib recursive function. And I'm, then I can call fib uh, recursive with, oh, let's just say six. You get the six Fibonacci number, uh, and you can see it kind of works through all of its recurse, 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 and says, oh, yep, your answer is eight, which is the right one, I think. If it's off by one, don't yell at me. It's been a long week. So, okay, so that's what we've got. And you'll notice here that we've got, we've got a doc string. So if I go look at this and I say, uh, Fib recursive doc. Yes, we got that. And if I try to do something illegal, like give it a negative two, uh, it's going to yell at me and say, ah, you failed your assertion. Okay, so far so good, pretty much standard. Uh, last thing I wanna do is, yes, I wanna disassemble this. Oh, sorry, I need to import the disassembler first. Where are you? There we go. There we go. Uh, so here's what we've got. Um, and let's see here. Let me back this up a hair. So this is our function. You notice the first thing it does, it comes in and loads stuff uh, and it does a comparison and to see if it's greater than zero. Uh, and if it isn't, it loads the assertion error and then raises it. So this is our first check. This is our assert check, right? Then notice that what it does here is it just prints the number. There isn't any condition here. There should be some sort of pop jump if true or pop jump if false, but no, it's not really a condition. It's just compiled in as a regular statement because 
in the life of that interpreter session, it can never change. We said it was true. It's going to be true. We're going to just take out the condition and just go with it. Okay. And then we got the rest of our stuff where we do our things and we, we call recursively uh, the two parts and we add whatever and we, we bring our thing back together again. Okay. So I know this is a little bit goofy, but the first things I want you to kind of hold in mind is this first couple of chunks where we are having our assertion error checked and then where we're printing our current numbers so that we can see where we're at. You know, this, this part is under an assert, this part is under a, an, an if dunder debug, uh, if statement, okay? All right, now I'm gonna bug out of this one. Now I'm gonna run this with the capital O for optimize. Okay, looks the same. First thing I wanna do is I wanna see if what dunder debug is. Dunder debug is now false. If I would have done that before, it would have told me Dunder debug was true. Okay, cool. So now what I want to do is, is my same old thing. So let me see. Let me recurse with my same six. So let's do that. Oh, sorry. I need to, re I need to load off of all this stuff. So... And you'll notice I'm one of these people I would rather scroll back 5,000 times, then hit, then type something in that's just six characters. Uh, and even when I do that, I get it wrong. See, um, let's import, import this while we're at it. Okay, so now, this time for sure, I'm gonna run this. And notice I don't get my debug output because debug is false. So that's expected. I just get my eight which is cool. Uh, and now notice, and let's see here what happens when we do negative two here. I don't get my assertion check. Instead, I get my recursion error, maximum recursion death exceeded in, in comparison. I've gone too far uh, in, in my recursions going on forever. So, um, okay. So, what happened to my assert? And I suppose I should say, I'm glad you asked. Let's disassemble this guy. Are you ready for this? So remember in the other one, the first thing we did was check the assert. Then we checked the, and did the print statement. And then we started doing our, our calculations and our recursions. So notice what is completely gone. The code relating to that assert statement doesn't even exist in the bytecode. It's not even compiled in. It was ignored when that file was loaded. And the same thing, our print statement since it knew debug was false, it's never going to change. It threw that code away too. It's not that it gets ignored. It's that, you know, in, in, when it's actually running, it's that it never makes it into the byte code to even possibly run. Therefore, if you are relying on an assert to check something at runtime, and someone decides that they want to run the interpreter with a dash capital O, your check will go away. It will not exist. Uh, usually when people think it's a great idea to use the certs for runtime checks and they find this out, there's this sort of moment of silence and then they go, oh, I think I'll fix that. So the, the, the lesson being here is that you cannot count on asserts for anything. Now, last thing, we can have a quick check here. Um, it's got a doc string. Okay, gonna quit, gonna add two O's. Uh, and then we can do a check here. So let's see here, I want to import this guy again. And um, should I say, I mean, still works, that's not different. 
But then when you look here, um, where'd you go? Where'd you go? There we go. There is no doc string anymore. So when you do it with two O's, it strips out the doc string. Now, neither of those optimization settings, I don't think is like super useful. Um, I don't want to spend the time timing it, but you could experiment and see if, if this were, if it helps at all. But the idea is by stripping out all of that, uh, all of the asserts and things like that, um, the if statement for, for if, if dunder debug print and things like that, uh, you would theoretically make your code go a little bit faster. And if you strip out all of the comments, you would theoretically make your bytecode file a little bit smaller. Therefore, it, presumably it would load a little bit faster. Um, not, not extremely like practical, I would say, in that sense. But you now know why it is you should never let anybody use an assert as part of the code that you're counting on actually functioning at runtime in production. Won't work. Okay, um, so now let's talk a little bit more about time. And I'm gonna use the time it module. And you can use time it from the command line. You can use time it uh, as, as an interface in your code. You can use uh, a time it has a class. You can use all of those things to time things. And in general, uh, I'm not gonna because I wanna just take the shortcut and use uh, the time it magic that uh, Jupyter Notebooks have, where they call time it without you having to worry about setting anything up. So it's just faster. So I've got some examples here in the Jupyter Notebook you can look at uh, for the way that it actually would work under those scenarios. Uh, of course, you can, can look at the other things, uh, but that's fine. So I think the one thing I wanna do is I'm going to compile these little test functions uh, just in case I don't compile them elsewhere. So basically my test here is just, uh, again, stringifying all of the digits uh, in, uh, from whatever up to a particular number, in this case 100, and uh, combining them together into a string where the numbers are separated by dashes. So, you know, see here I made a string of the, digit, of the numbers from 0 to 99 uh, separated by dashes, so that's all one big string. Uh, it's, again, just an operation that will take a certain amount of time so that we can test, get a little bit comfortable with testing things for how long they take. Uh, and um, I, I've got this, where do I have this on down here? Well, let's see here. Yeah, let me actually go ahead and do this right now. So I can do that, and I think I want to use my other function here, which is uh, join digits 100. Okay, so I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do uh, time it join digits uh, 100. Okay. Um, and that should be fine. I don't think I need to give that a parameter or anything. Uh, so we'll get the times for these two things. Now, I guess before I do this, um, you, can, you can think about which one of these you might think would be, uh, would be the faster. Um, are we going to do... Uh, is that going to be faster? Uh, that is where we do this and do a join after we've done this. And you'll notice here, I've got a generator going. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, versus this one where we just have a regular old for loop and we're doing string concatenation. So you can place your bets, we can bet which one of these will be faster. Um, and you can think about, you can think about why you might say that too. And let's, let's just start the race. Okay. Uh, I would do race announcer commentary, except I suck at things like that. So I'm not even going to bother to try. Um, so let's see. Okay. There's, 
There's Concat Stir is our first one. Uh, and it took 173 milliseconds. And you can see time it gives you all sorts of, of, of things about how to do this. Uh, well, it tells you it did a bunch of loops, it did seven runs, it did 10,000 loops. So it averaged all of those together to get you an average per loop. Those are, should be pretty reliable. Uh, 173. Um, there, and then we have uh, microseconds. And then we have uh, on this one, uh, where we're using the join digit thing with uh, using join rather than concatenation. Uh, notice it took 110 nanoseconds. So we've got uh, a, a orders of magnitude better performance here, clearly. And in order to take the same amount of time, spend the same amount of time, it did seven, seven passes through. But in this case, rather than doing 10,000 loops, uh, it did 10 million loops because, in fact, it was that much faster. It was a thousand times faster. So there we go. So this is the time at magic, uh, and that works in uh, IPython as well. So that, that's cool. It's an IPython kind of magic. So uh, definitely easier than setting it up to do it sort of the longhand way uh, where you have to, where, where you figure it out. But those are options, too, if you need to. So that's measuring it. Cool. A um, couple more things as we kind of work through this stuff. Um, I realize we're, we're at an hour, but I've been going like an hour and 10, hour and 15. So I'll certainly wrap it up by then. Um, people, particularly from other languages, have given uh, exceptions a bad idea, a bad rep. Exceptions are slow. They're awful. You shouldn't rely on exceptions. What is Python thinking? Uh, so I want to just test this out, test this theory out. So here I've got a while loop that counts to a thousand. And you'll notice it doesn't use a for loop because when we were talking about iteration, remember a for loop raises at least one exception. So this has been kind of designed to have no for loops and be absolutely as simple as possible. So yes, we've got an integer times an integer, and then we've got incrementing an integer by one. We've got a while loop that sort of loops back and does an if statement. So we don't have very many pieces here at all, right? Now my alternative is a class, and this is an iterable class. We talked about uh, iteration the other time. So this just kind of behaves uh, like a list or, or a tuple or something like that, except all it will do is access things by, uh, by index. So in fact, if I say, give me uh, object bracket one, it just says one and throws it back. So that's all it does. So it doesn't do anything either. But it will raise uh, an index error when we get to the end of the, the, the length that we want to do. And then we'll do a for loop down here, which will raise a stop iteration error. Uh, when we do for I encounter, we create an iterator behind the scenes. The iterator will raise stop iteration. It knows to raise stop iteration because it got an index error. So that's two exceptions. Okay, uh, so what do you think? Will test while loop be faster, the same, or slower? than using the custom class. Place your bets. The same sounds reasonable. OK, um, and, and thanks for answering. Let's go ahead and start the race. So time it is doing its run right now. 509 microseconds, half a millisecond, uh, five microseconds. So in fact, it's 10 times faster to use two exceptions than it is to avoid exceptions altogether. Uh, there's kind of a reason for that. Uh, and it's that is that in fact, raising two exceptions out of you know counting to um, uh, a thousand uh, is not really very much. So exceptions, you can actually set up conditions where exceptions are slower. If you have exceptions everywhere, it's not a great thing. But 
If it's just this sort of thing used in loop flow control, it's not much. Whereas up here, this operation is a bear because we're continually creating a new integer each time. So, uh, you know, up to the first, uh, I don't know how many it is. It's, I think it's more than 10, but up to the first certain number of integers, uh, those are kind of cached and, and might well exist as objects already. After that, each time we do i plus one, we're creating a new integer object and that's what's slowing this implementation down. So again, it's just a sneaky thing. Um, there are other things that you can do. Um, I think in the interest of moving on, uh, if you're ever tempted to use a list as a queue, um, you might want to be careful about that because uh, particularly inserting things and popping things out of the front of the queue is not an efficient operation in the current implementation of Python. If you want to do things where you're continually sticking things at the front and pulling things off the front of a list, then you probably want to use a deck, a double-ended queue object, which lives in a collections library. Uh, and it is optimized for doing things like that. So I guess just for the sake of illustration, we can kind of pop that through real fast uh, and see what comes out because it'll only take a few seconds to figure it out. So 62 milliseconds for a list being forced to be a queue and 13, 14 milliseconds using a deck. So it's again, using the right tool can help. And speaking of the right tool, uh, this one, if you have a function that is, re is called repeatedly with the same value, uh, the cache decorator from uh, funk tools, LRU cache, uh, it's configurable, it's got lots of tricks, but basically if you use this decorator in front of a function, it will automatically cache for you uh, the results of that function. So it will look at the function signature and the parameter that you passed it. And every time it sees the same parameter going in, it doesn't do the function, it just gives you back the value. Okay, so I've got two similar functions. I've got just a plain old Fibonacci function that recurses. And then here I've got one that is also a Fibonacci uh, function that recurses, but I'm using LRU cache. Okay, so let me, let me compile that guy. And then we're gonna do, we're gonna time the fib function. And it, it's only going for 10 Fibonacci numbers, so it's not like it's the world. Uh, and then we're gonna time the recursive one. Okay, and here too, you can think about it, but I'm gonna spoil this one for you. It's not that the fib recursive cache function is faster, it's how much faster it is that will blow you away. So 23 micro, 123 microseconds, not shabby, uh, 156 nanoseconds. So again, we're getting not quite three orders of magnitude, but uh, a ton, a ton of speed uh, increase. And if you know that you are using that same thing over and over again, and you've got the cache, you've got the memory to spare so that you can afford to cache the results, then this is like a free way of getting a huge, huge speed up. So definitely worth a try. Okay, my last one is um, the, uh, that should be a markdown cell, let me. Uh, do that. The last one that I'm going to talk about in our, our last few minutes here is using Cython. Cython is basically a, a, a way to compile in bits of uh, code that look like Python, but compile them in as uh, C libraries that you can load and use. So we're going to do the same example here uh, but we're going to use uh, Cython in some of our experiments to see what this does to, to our performance. 
And at the very end, there's a, a, a cell illustrating how you do Cython outside of uh, IPython. But right now, I am going to be lazy and use the Cython magic because it makes things go so much faster. So I make sure I got Cython loaded. It's already loaded, I thought so. Okay, uh, I've got my recursive. This is gonna be the control here. It's a recursive Fibonacci thing. I think it's horribly clever and I love it and I wanna use it. So I wanna see how it stacks up against other things. Okay, this one here is exactly the same function Okay, since it's recursive, I had to kind of change the name so I wasn't calling the wrong thing. It's the same thing, but we're going to use Cython to basically compile it as a C uh, library, C object that we can load and use inside of Python. And as I say, this will all be done behind the scenes. So let me see, make sure I got that, make sure I got that. Okay, so I got that. Now this one is a variation we can do on Cython where we actually start giving it extra information. If we give it type information, Cython can make better, more efficient C code. So this isn't like, uh, you know, type hints in, in regular Python. This is specific stuff that uh, the Cython um, compiler will look at so that it can optimize how it creates the C code that we're gonna use. So what I've done is I've told it that we're going to use long integers. And that's the only thing I've told it. Okay. Uh, and then my last two examples, we're wrapping up here. Uh, I've got another one where I decided recursion wasn't that cool because it's a ton of function calls. I'm just going to do this via loops. And then I thought, wait a second, suppose I do it in Cython with type information. Ooh, so let me do that. So here we've got this whole bunch of things and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the races. So here we're testing uh, the plain one, the Cython version that's just the same code in Cython, uh, the typed version, and then we're also gonna implement it as just a loop rather than recursive. And then we're gonna try that with a, a nicely typed uh, Cython version. So we got all of these, so uh, we're off to the races. Um, and we can see what happens here. It's going to take us a little while, so let me pop down and, and talk about this. If you were wanting to use Cython outside of, of, of uh, the an IPython environment that has the magic and makes life easy, basically you create a PYX file. And so this is Python code, but it's in a PYX file. And then you can use a setup.py file to tell Cython how to build this, how to compile it into a module. So uh, if we have this file and we have a setup.py file that says, okay, look, we're gonna Cythonize this file that we made up here. Uh, and then I call it this way, Python setup.py, build an external uh, library in place uh, it's going to grind away. And then the next thing I can do is I can actually uh, run my Python interpreter and import fib, and I will have my, my uh, function uh, available there, and it will be fast. So, so that's what we got. Now let's see if the race is over. Oh, yeah, I think the race is over. So my plain old recursive function took 170 milliseconds. Uh, if I Cythonized it, I cut that by about to, to about a fourth of the time. So instead of 170 uh, microseconds, it's uh, about 40 microseconds. So that's, that's less than 25% of the time. If I give it type information, notice it goes down to 2.66 microseconds. So that's good. But on the flip side, if I just would have done a loop rather than being fancy and having to write a recursive function, I would have had a, just a plain old Python function that was uh, under eight microseconds. But if I did that in Cython with all the type information, it then goes down to just a little over half a microsecond. So uh, Cython is kind of a cool tool. No, you don't want to run your entire program through Cython because it's 
Uh, it's not really designed for that. You're going to find all sorts of edge cases that it's not good at. But if you know exactly where it is you need to uh, optimize for speed, then this can be a really handy thing. And that's, as I say, if using something like LRU cache or switching from recursive to a loop, if some of those other optimizations don't work, then uh, using uh, Cython can, can be a handy thing. Uh, anybody have any questions or, or anything at all? Um, this will sort of end up being put over on my YouTube channel and things like that um, before too terribly long. Uh, I will go ahead and put this up, uh, this notebook up in the um, uh, GitHub repo. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I think otherwise it's kind of um, at the point where um, I'll be uh, switching over and, and, and turning things off. Any final questions? Um... Do I use Cython in professional life? I have a time or two. Uh, I don't usually because a lot of what, what I do with my team professionally uh, has to do more with processes where this kind of speed up isn't going to matter. Um, if I was dealing with, I don't know, for example, financial data or I had, you know, real uh, demands in terms of moving a lot of information very, very quickly, uh, I would certainly be looking at it a lot more. Uh, for most of the things that, that I think my team does, uh, we, would, we could certainly speed up a function or, or an operation by maybe, you know, 75, 95%, but in the end, that would mean that we would gain, you know, who knows, five seconds out of an operation that's going to take us 30 minutes. So is it worth the time? Nah, probably not. Um, but it's always something we talk about. Okay, anything else? Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, I know that some of you are out there uh, and um, I am planning uh, to be back next week. I haven't quite decided what I'll be doing, but it might be poking at uh, list dictionaries and, and sets and things like that. Um, if anybody has something that they really would like to see, you can let me know either you know in the chat or on Twitter or the various channels where I can be found. Uh, always be open to other ideas. Um, okay, well, with that, I am going to switch over to uh, my bye-bye screen. Um, and like I say, uh, thanks for people turning up. And um, I will see those of you who care to uh, again uh, sometime in the future. So again, take care, everybody, and uh, we'll see you later.